This is video tape number three. Right now, so I wandered around trying to find bright, smart people who could impromptu uh, entertain you and inform you until he could be located. Here's Swift. Obviously, this is totally impromptu, so I hope you have no expectations whatsoever because I will surely let you down. Um, However, uh, since uh, DA was uh, kind enough to inform me that there was a spare spot for which I could kind of spew all my soapbox garbage, uh, you're going to be my victims until Simple Nomad shows up. I, um, I, would, I have several things I, I want to talk about, um, the first of which is quality of service and IP version 6. Um, Obviously, Cisco and some of the other router manufacturers are scrambling or, and or have already have implementations. Um, RFCs are in place, and so we're rapidly approaching an era where at least we are able to deploy IP version 6. Uh, you've heard estimates anywhere from 5 to 10 years down the road. I've heard, you know, next year, everybody's got their own bullshit opinion on, you know, when, when it's going to actually be deployed. But I, I want to have, uh, I want to take an opportunity opportunity just to express like my dislike and concern over um, and and I, I think there's a distinct lack of of focus on some of the key things and the, the key features of IP version 6 that are being called features but really if you break them down and if you really consider the implications of the features are um, bad. Let's just keep, keep it at that. Um, the first of which is, of course, uh, the, the, I'll, I'll cover the good stuff first for those of you who are not completely familiar with IP version 6. Obviously, IP version 4 is what we're using now. Um, it is designed, it was designed back in the 70s, late 70s, by the government, and uh, it's there it was not designed for the massive traffic that we have on the internet. And so, the initial initiative, uh, the initial initiative, the initiative to create a new uh, addressing scheme and addressing space uh, was. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe it was an IEEE or IETF uh, initiative. So it was your Internet Engineering Task Force, and everybody knows the IEEE. Um, the solution that they came up with was IP version six. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they skipped version five, but hey, maybe they just wanted to stick to even numbers or something. Um, I've, I've read the spec, I've looked at the, I've looked at the implementations that are out there, um, especially the Linux implementation. Okay, yeah, just, I'll just duck you guys with tomatoes or whatever, but, uh, anyway, so, and I've also looked at some of the, uh, some of the stuff that Cisco's got out there and discussing it and, uh, the, and of course, obviously, the RFCs. Um, IP version 6 is, it, it, they, they, someone told me, and I, I'm not sure if this is entirely correct, but uh, I'll use this anyway, that version 6 actually has uh, more addresses available. The addressing scheme is larger than the, or more numerous than there are grains of sand on the planet Earth. So until they make computers about the size of grains of sand, which hell knows how long that'll be next year or so, uh, <laughs> then uh, we'll, we won't run out of schemes. Did you, did you have something to add to that? Every proton could have an IP address. There you go. And it's something like it's something like it's it's addressed uh, in. I want to say there are 32 sets of colon delimited. Usually it's written in a colon delimited format, and there are 32 sets of two with hex addressing. So. Somebody can do the math in their head, not me, but that, that's a lot. And uh, anyway, it's 128-bit, correct, right? But uh, so the biggest problem that I have with uh, with IP version six is quality of service. Quality of service is built in to IP version six. There are a number of things that are built in: the large addressing scheme, the um, the authentication. IPsec is actually a lot of the the IPsec implementations are supposedly um, compliant with the, the implementation that's set forth in the RFCs uh, covering version six, and so. 
uh, a lot of these things are already in place as far as, at least in theory, and most of them are, are do work in the implementations that I've seen, especially in the Linux version. And um, quality of service, for those of you who don't know, is, for, is to keep, tr is to regulate traffic, to not, not necessarily to shape traffic, but it is to regulate the traffic um, going through massive clear routers or, or even on a small scale. But the, really the, the goal of quality of service was so that large providers could take um, traffic that was considered low priority, like uh, us, <laughs> and there you go. That, that, that's what I'm getting at. I, my biggest problem with IP version 6 is that IP version 6, even though it's, it's called quality of service, it is quality of service. It's quality of service for the corporate and, and the rich and the customers who can pay. Because what's happening in a lot of ISPs, and I'm sure half of you here probably will work for ISPs and can probably will probably be able to nod your head in agreement, that when you go to the bean counters, they, they tend to want to know, why is it that I'm routing traffic for other people who aren't paying me anything? Isn't that... Isn't that, doesn't, something's wrong with that. Forget the fact that the internet was founded on that very idea and that they wouldn't even probably be there if it wasn't for that fact. But, but why is it that we're routing traffic for other people? And especially priority traffic because some old router implementations, are, and if you want to get technical, and push uh, with TCP flags set like urgent and push flags um, are given higher priority just based on the fact that they have flags set in the TCP header. And so your router is actually pushing the traffic a little bit, uh, depending on where you're coming from and what kind of uh, what kind of flags you have set, can push traffic a little faster. And so it's interesting uh, to these people, these what, what should we call them, pointy hairs or bean counters, uh, that. Um, that they're, that they're basically giving a free service. Um, and they don't seem to understand that the fact that there's, there's traffic coming in as well, that, that, uh, that other people are routing their traffic for free. It's, uh, that, that, that idea just doesn't seem to take hold very well. But IP version 6, see IP version 6 is the fix to all this. It's wonderful. Because you combine the fact that you can use quality of service and type of service routing, which means that if a packet comes from this guy that pays me a lot of money, uh, I want to route that at high priority. If a packet comes from Swift trying to tell that to his machine, I want to route that to the lowest possible priority. And, and not only, pri when I say priority, I don't just mean dropping packets, I mean latency as well. Cisco's implementation actually uh, changes, you can actually cue your latency, or what's a, what's a way to describe it? It'll actually lower your latency if you, if you are at a, at a lower priority uh, in, the, in, in your type of service flags are set as a lower priority than someone that they have set at a higher priority. Well, obviously this opens up a whole, a whole range of things that we, for, for hackers to try to screw around with, but the biggest problem, uh, or one of the big things that face, that face the hacker that tries to hack IPv6 is it is quite secure. The implementation, uh, I won't say quite secure, but it, it's, it's much better than IP version 4 because it has built-in crypto. You have built-in MD5 authentication and headers. That's, that's just one way you can do it. I mean, you can just plug in your own, uh, if you want to break the spec a little bit, you can plug in whatever you want. SHA or whatever kind of hashing that you want to use or, or checksums that you want to use to make sure that the packet came from the guy who's, you know, signing checks to you at the end of the month. And so, my biggest problem with it is 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 that another problem is that uh, I've been I've I've kind of I mean, this is where I, I I'm going to go off the deep end here, but I I, I have a, a lot of conspiracy th theories about IP version six because some of the bean counters love it because of the quality of service those who understand it and I'm sure that that idea is really going to catch on soon uh, is it, it is catching on but I think it's going to catch on uh, like wildfire when it actually shows up in business journal or something. Um, but I think that the other big problem is that people fear it because of the, the, IPSEC, the IPSEC IP security implementations that are already, have already been established and put into, uh, are being put into practice even in version 4. We've, we've sort of torn out that little module because everybody was screaming for it and uh, stuck it in most, any, I think any iOS version uh, past 11.2 for Cisco routers has got some level of, of IPSEC implementation into it. Um, some of the routers have, have actual crypto uh, WIX 
pipes and the column that you plug into in there. That is basically a, a facility for you to tunnel from one end to the other with a with a crypto tunnel. And some of it, some of the older routers have, uh, I believe, the AGS routers. Paul, you you could probably correct me on this. You work with AGS stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm sure you yeah. have. <laughs> look at this look on his face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have you ever worked with any crypto stuff for the AGS? Um, no, because I code on Yeah, well, they have the crypto modules, you know, the black box modules that you, the, the, the VME cards that you plug right into the sides. Have you ever seen those? AGS. AGS, yeah. And AGS, well, I guess it's AGS pluses that I'm thinking of, but still, they're still AGS models. <laughs> Haven't seen those? They're rare, but they, but they do, they are, they, they're pre-IPSEC and they do exist. They're DES implementations. And, uh, so you have the, you have one side who, uh, it, it causes the crypto, you, you inform the crypto mass hysteria and then quietly um, while we're pushing uh, and steaming ahead trying to get crypto you know pushed through every orifice that we can possibly get it into um, you end up with uh, you end up we're actually trying to help IP version 6 along because we're facing the same problems that all the businesses are facing lack of address space um, lack of authentication that type of thing but my uh, to sort of wrap up and to keep from being redundant, I, my theory about version 6 is this. The internet, this is, we'll, we'll see if my prediction comes true, but the internet's going to turn into something akin to television. Or if, if IP version 6 takes hold and takes off. Because those, the, the, the teeming unwashed hordes are not the ones, as I said before, signing the checks to Sprint and MCI and Quicks and everybody else who's got, who's got Sonnet networks stretched across all the world. And sharing traffic, and another, another factor is the fact that all of these links now are sharing traffic with IP, uh, with voice over IP. And uh, there, are, there are a number of implementations and a number of routers, but obviously Cisco's got 80% of the market or more. I, that's the last figure I heard. And uh, so theirs is the most popular. But um, not everyone, not all networks, especially when you talk about um, great, big, great big MAEs with Sonnet running through them, not everybody has separate links for voice over IP. So they would really love to be able to 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 be able to push their traffic over yours, and that you know I am not completely against having video conferencing and that kind of multicast traffic with higher priority. But the problem is that the priorities and type of service keys are not. The point is that they are not based on the service, and that's the illusion. They are not based on what you're doing. They're based on who you are paying. And so the people that have the money right now, obviously, the corporations have went, uh, I'll go off on a tangent here until Simple Sense shows up, but um, has Simple showed up already? Okay. You're doing a great job. Talk to you later. Make a few minutes. No problem. Let me just interrupt him midstream so he loses complete stream of thought there. Uh, first of all, if anybody's looking for area A, the newbie area, you get to it through by going through the hotel, access it that way. Uh, number two, this is obviously not the newbie area, so if you have no idea what he's talking about, you probably shouldn't be here because it's not going to make a lot of sense to you. Number two, if you didn't hear it earlier, uh, the whole thing about uh, putting cigarettes out on a carpet. Um, Bad notice. I've gone through some sensitivity training. So last year I, I would have said, thank you. Last year I would have said, what in the hell are you thinking? And I'm going to say, help me understand, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> Did mommy not let you put the big boy pants on? <laughs> Don't put the cigarettes out on the carpet. Put it on your friend's back. Put it out in, the, in a cup of coffee. Put it out in an ashtray. That's where it belongs. Put it on CNN's coffee. Put it on CNN. <laughs> <laughs> You're wearing a staff shirt. Don't say that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to let him hop back on. After this, we're going to have Mr. Mojo, I believe, up uh, giving a quick speech. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to you. And uh, iOS version 9 is what we're on the AGS. Cool. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up if someone's, someone else is going to hop on. But uh, let me get... <laughs> How about this? Yeah. All right. Um... Back in about, in the 1900s, in small towns, there were about, say, a town of 30,000. You would usually find um, about 
sometimes around three, as many as nine newspapers in a, in a small city. And what happened was, towards the 1950s, well, let me, get, let me take this back one more step. All the people that owned these newspapers, they were family owned. The media, there wasn't these, this big corporate media state, so all the newspapers were family owned. And what happened was, they, they, they managed to, uh, because they weren't public and because they didn't have to report what they made to the SEC, uh, only to the IRS, which is obviously not available to all of us, maybe some of us, but um, anyway, the, uh, what happened was that they went quite a while and with the illusion that they weren't making any money. And so no one was really that interested in newspapers because all well, newspaper was a losing business and, and newspapers were really crying a lot about um, how they had to um, how they had to uh, had this great operating cost and, and they really did. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of margin around the turn of the century, but that all changed. Towards the, towards the 1950s, people got the notion that they could actually nearly give away newspapers, and and they could and, and at the t at the time, uh, the only way to do that was to sell advertising. And so they that's I mean if you pick up a newspaper now, it's you know two thirds ad, one third content, and most of the content content is syndicated. It's not local content anyway, or at least a proportion of it. So what happened was in the 1950s, all these people who had owned newspapers for generations, like there was a there was this law, and I don't know if it's still in the books, but at the time, the third the third generation that gets passed down an inheritance from a large estate, there's a great big inheritance tax that they get hit with, and because they were because these newspapers were privately owned. The inheritance, the inheritance tax just killed these people, and they didn't want to pay it, obviously. And so what they did instead was they incorporated before Dad died. And so when you incorporate, you, you're sheltered a little bit from taxes, and you all know about you know how the uh, the government favors corporations as far as the the tax laws and just about anything else. But um, at the time, they they incorporated as small, you know. Corporations, and, and then in the 60s and the 70s, things as things marched on, they started to merge. All these newspapers. Well, what would happen is uh, you had communications companies that were number one that were buying up newspapers. Then you had these mega rich, you know, people like Rupert Murdoch who would go out and buy uh, a newspaper in one city, and then they would, uh, and then they would go to the other mega rich newspaper baron and say, Can I, "This is actually relating to computers. I'm getting. I mean, I am going somewhere with this." Uh, they would go out and they would go out and buy um, another newspaper, and then they would kind of get together and they would do something called collusion. And they would say, I'll tell you what, if you, if you close down your newspaper in San Francisco, I'll close down my newspaper in Dallas. Sounds good to me. Okay, boom. And they did it. And so, uh, besides the fact that, like, uh, <laughs> uh, you have things like syndicated columns where one guy can write and 80 papers get it. But what happened was you had a, a focused uh, conglomeration, conglomeration of all the media entities. And we're all real familiar with that. I'm sure that's, a co that's common knowledge. But with IP version 6 coming into existence and with the internet just exploding all around us, uh, I think it's, it's, it, it seems like it's glaring me in the face that it, it is the next logical step. Uh, and, and I think we've all seen how... I used to work in an ISP about two years ago, two and a half years ago. It was a small ISP. Um, and we had about 500 customers, and I ended up, I, I wanted to move out of the city, I got tired of living there, so, I, so what I did was I ended up selling a lot of uh, my customer base to another ISP there and just kind of switching everybody over. And so I guess you could call that a merger in a way, um, we, were, we were incorporated. But then I, I came back, um, right before I came to DEF CON, they had been bought out by Morris Communications, this ISP. And then, I, and then I asked a guy that worked for the Globe News there, also owned by Morris Communications, why are you buying up ISPs? And he said, well, I talked to the vice president about that, and he said, it just sounded like the thing to do. <laughs> sounded like the thing to do. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then the internet is the next big thing. And I, I wasn't around, but I have the feeling that television was uh, sort of along the same lines. Um, because I have seen some of the old commercials back in the 1950s when, when the TV was, people started actually going out and buying TVs. And it did occur to me, and it also occurred to a, a guy named Benjamin uh, Bagadikian who wrote a book called The Media Monopoly. You should definitely check out that book if you haven't read it. It's an excellent book. Um, it's
it's, it's not a conspiracy theory book. The guy goes through and documents everything he says. But it, it seemed apparent to him that back in the 50s, commercials were, uh, commercials were so silly that they were a joke because you had a lot of programming that was very serious. And uh, so what, what ended up happening was the commercials would come on in the middle of the serious, you know, you know, Ibsen or something, some drama, and they would just be like, you know, happy, happy, beer, beer, you know, and, and so you'd have a, it was, it seemed completely ignorant. But nowadays, commercial programming is so brainless that when it does come on, uh, it just basically, it just flows right along with the programming, and it keeps, and, and the marketing, pe marketing people have a term that they use, and it's called the buying mood. And the buying mood is, means that you're not thinking. So when you're not thinking, it's easy to sell you a product by just showing you a lot of boobs or, you know, showing you, you know, whatever you want to see and, and uh, a fantasy, essentially. And uh, it just goes right along with the fantasy that you've been watching, the brainless fantasy that you've been watching on television. Obviously, I'm not real pro-TV here. Um, however, when I'm sitting in front of my computer, I'm interacting with it, right? I don't, personally, I'm a Unix nut, you know, I don't have anything against anybody else, but I'm sitting in front of it, you know, I'm sitting at a show prompt, and I have to type in, if I don't know what to do, I am screwed. That's it. I mean, that's as simple as that. So I'm thinking. And it occurs to me that when you can control who gets who gets the, the, the high bandwidth and the broadband access, that or the broadband access server access where they can actually they can set up servers on T3s and sonnet nets like Sprint, MCI and all these and all the others, and MSNBC, these types. Um, it it occurs to me that at some point they're going to realize that I'm not in a buying mood. And that's bad because when I'm not in a buying mood they can't sell me stuff. And so the solution to that is to make it so hard for me to use the services that I want to use and make it so easy for me to just get on and watch, you know, Baywatch or some drivel on my, you know, internet at will every episode, marathon, with just, you know, a tad of commercial programming. Um, it seems like a much more profitable enterprise. And I don't think I'm the first person to think that, to, to dream this up. Call me, a, call me a conspiracy nut. But uh, anyway, I am about to talk that, and I don't want to get redundant on you people. I'm sure most of you have probably had the same exact thought, but I want to just kind of lay it out on the table, and uh, you know, if anybody wants to talk to me about it over beer or something like that, I'd be happy to, happy to do it. So um, I'm, I'm sure, oh, we got questions. Cool. Discussion. I think quality of service is, I think type of service flags in the IP version 6 headers and quality of service should have been engineered. See, it was engineered for these people. IETF, I mean, it was engineered by engineers, smart guys, people who are much smarter than me, I'm sure, but it was engineered by people who, somebody was signing a check for them. And this wasn't a free standard. Nobody came up, nobody wrote, you know, wrote this and submitted it. This was a, a task force that actually came up with this. So, my, this is the whole OSI versus TCP thing, uh, or TCP IP. You know, the OSI approach has always been get a whole bunch of people, pay them a lot, put them in a room, come up with a really cool standard, and see if we can get anybody to implement it. And the TCP IP model has been, well, whatever happens when you put a whole buttload of people in the same room together, or in the same network together, whatever they seem to sort of converge on, that's what will make the standard. You know, and once you've converged on it long enough, then do it. And that's, that's what I think should happen to IP version 6. But personally, if I could have my way over everything, I would like to see the type of service flags in IP version 6 be directed towards service. You know, not, um, and the services be, be somewhat logical and not not keys like um, well urgent flags in, in IP version 6 are set by originators and originators are authenticated and so meaning if you're sprint or if you're let's say you're CNN and you're paying SprintNet well you're you, you get the, you, you automatically get priority and that's kind of 
weird. <laughs> I mean, call it, it, it may seem like a great marketing idea, and it probably is. It'll probably make a handful of people a whole lot of money, but it's not going to help me. And uh, so I would like to see things be a little more practical, directed towards um, the, the, the actual type of traffic that's being passed. And I think, and yes, I think version 6 should be re-engineered. I think that uh, it should be more practical as well, because the, the addressing scheme is, uh, right now, the implementations are, are, because of the cryptography that's involved, um, are shaky and untested and I, and I just think that it should, it should have been one of the things that were sort of thrown to the masses and then regurgitated in some usable form. Anybody else got anything to say? This guy. You think that with the advances in technology when you go on, I mean, it's not that we dialed up from the ability of the cable mode and it's got its DSL. I mean, it's not all that hard to clean my bucks with that 1.8 downstream. Broadband access is everywhere, sure. It's really sweet. Do you think that it's really going to make any difference? Like, I know with the peer-to-peer network, a lot of small ISPs are having a problem getting... Sure, you run you run a bunch of people into your mucks, and you and you've got even though they've got 10 megabit on a you know super cable mode, I mean you, you you're plugged, still plugged into a T1 kind of thing. Yeah, do you think it's going to make any difference? Uh, do you think technology is going to advance the next point, the next years, and years where people at home are going to be able to get enough bandwidth where it doesn't really make any difference? Like what the grade is actually paying for? Well, that. I think I know what your question is because I've, I've had this discussion again like over beers and let me paraphrase for you. you you've got so much bandwidth out there you've got so much there's so much available to, to the average user like he says you know you, you pay 40 bucks a month and you get broadband access you know and th there are some of the problems I think the, the problems that, that, we, that we were just kind of discussing like uh, you know your upstream is, is saturated or, or you've got you know um, uh, you, you know, some kind of routing problem, or, or, or there's a technology problem like uh, some. I know that with some DSL loops, you, you end up having a shared collision domain once you get out onto the fiber, and then you get saturated there. But, but I think you know, technology is going by leaps and downs, and I'm sure I, I don't know whether everybody would share this share this with me, but I think that uh, those the, the, the bandwidth problems will be resolved as far as being able to pass a lot of traffic. The problem is that. It, when you get down to the core of the net, it really, I mean, you're getting into the, in, into the two gigabit stuff nowadays and, and, even, and even bigger, you know, with the, the dual and triple and quadruple distributed uh, fiber MAEs and this kind of thing. But um, I still think that uh, as our needs grow, well, let me give you an example. Uh, take cable TV. This was the same deal with cable TV. Everybody out there has got a video camera. I mean, you know, what's the percentage of people with video cameras? Lots of people, lots of common Joes have video cameras. There are laws in most states, and I, I don't know if they're federal statute, but I, I know that when cable was sort of being tariffed and people were just trying to figure out what to do with cable when it was a, when it was a nice new thing, they said, we need to make sure that the common man has to have access to cable. We need to make sure that the common guy has got a ca public access cable channel and that he can get to it, you know. Well, I have, I still, have, in Colorado Springs where I live, there's a, there's a public access cable channel. It's crap. I, I could turn it on and I see like, you know, crap, <laughs> basically. You know, I mean, various types of crap, but it's all crap. Uh, and, uh, and, and the reason it's crap is because like, the few times when I do watch TV, like I gotta admit, you know, I like Star Trek, okay? I'm a, uh, and I, so I turn over to Star Trek, now, there's probably some guy who's got a video camera and he's going around taping, you know, animals at the zoo I saw one time and, you know, how to speak Spanish, this kind of thing. I mean, you know, useful stuff, valid stuff, but he's, you know, it's grainy and gosh, you know, there's, there's so many more. There's, there's cool, there's seven of nine for Christ's sakes, you know, I mean, <laughs> how is she going to, how is he going to compete with that, you know? I, and I see the same thing happening with broadband access. I think... I, me with my website and my limited time. I mean, hell, I have to earn. You know, I have to go to work, and I have to. And I am a, a normal person. I don't have a production studio, and when, and broadband access. Here we go. We're streaming video now. We're streaming audio now, and so 
I mean, I, I see it going the same direction. I see me being the public access cable guy screaming, I think version 6 is bad, you know, or bad is good, baby, down with government, you know, I mean, or something, you know. And, uh, you know, and then you flipping over or hitting your channel bar and going to, you know, Baywatch or 7 of 9 in my case. So, uh, and, and I, really I feel like that, loop, that that completely drains, that completely puts a stress on people, new users of the internet who are never going to experience what I experienced. They're never going to experience at least 56K line to the university and thinking, God, I am God, you know? You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, just things like that, you know? So, I... I, I, I agree with you, but I don't think it'll make a difference. Anybody else? You. Uh, actually, uh, it, it, the Internet 2 is, is like a buzzword. That's what... Uh, is there anybody from CNN here? From CNN guys? Yeah, that's what people like CNN and other clueless individuals use for, for, uh, for version 6. Not saying you're clueless. It, it's a valid question, and I had to ask the same question. But Internet 2. Yeah, Internet 2. It, well, actually, the Internet 2 encompasses a few other things. It, it encompasses some of the larger uh, um, backbones that they're trying to build, like um, with uh, the universities and some and that type of thing. But they are deploying version IP version 6 on those networks, so they're kind of synonymous. Not exactly, but uh, usually when you talk about Internet version 2, you're talking about a whole spectrum of things, and it's really it depends on who you're talking to, whether it's CNN or. NBC or whoever, you know, time. Anybody else? I'll, I'll vacate here. The author's name is Ben uh, Bagadikian, and uh, that is an awesome book. It's awesome. It's 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 not for people who enjoy reading fiction because it's like fact, 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 fact. But it's it's really good. Bagadikian. I, I, you can find it. Uh, it's it's published. Funny enough, funny enough, it, it's published by some kind of independent publisher because he couldn't get it published by any of the corporate uh, publishing houses. Not in that, not in. And, uh, they didn't like him slamming it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else want a question? Back here. All right. All right. I'll start with the assumption that IP version 4 can all be the same sort of competitive chaos that we know in the world of life. Well, IP version 4 did not. You know, IP version 4 was a, exactly was a DOD. Right. The assumption that with people like you and I, I mean, I remember the class in 9600 value of the house. Yeah, for sure. But we grew up in the end, but they will keep evolving because we can keep coming in with new stuff. And we put it all you may not, but but you, it'll be forced on you if you run out of, if you run out of addresses, especially when people give out class C's like they were free. You. <laughs> no, he's Paul. Paul has done us a big favor by hooking us up, and then we could probably use a lot more than that. But to, I'll get you in just a second. But but just to address that, I think uh, there is a critical difference, and the critical difference is that IP version six has sort of been thrust upon us by the industry. Um, IP version four was adopted in lieu of OSI, uh, SNA, and all the other standards that were available. You know, we could have done we could have done all these other things, but we sort of said, "Ooh, this is cool." Cool. Let's do that. The guy back here, you had a question. That, this is true. You have a valid point, but uh, my op I, uh, this is just a difference of opinion. My opinion is that uh, the model works fine. And the, the the deal is that there's not an immediate there's not an immediate um, 
What am I? I'm, I'm reaching here. There's not a, there is not an immediate gain for passing someone else's traffic. So we have a very short-sighted corporate media state, you know. And if and if your bottom line and your shareholders are not happy at the end of the quarter, then you're in big trouble. And I think that that's the attitude that has spawned version six. Version four is still can still be profitable, and it can and it can create an atmosphere that's very uh, conducive to learning and and uh, advancement. But I think that and, and the, version six could be the same. I just think that uh, there's a critical difference in that, you know, <laughs> this was not, again, this was not designed by someone else and we just kind of adopted it. It was thrust on us. Yeah. What's that? Okay. It looks like we've got another speaker coming in. Thank God! So I'll quit struggling and get out of your face and you can enjoy someone who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much.